I'm happy, really happy to be here. I know it's the last session, you are pretty tired, but please bear with me. I'll try to be brief, but I don't promise anything. Okay, is there everybody here? Hopefully so. Okay, so welcome to my talk. It's uh, Privet Mienia Zavod Maciek, or I think I should speak more or less like this. Uh, I was an algebraist topologist for uh, many, many years, but for like seven years, I'm working in best Warsaw software house named Tog. So if you plan to work in Warsaw, just give us, give us a hint. And today, what we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about data house, about streams and flows of data that you can gather from social apps, your applications, and that, yeah? Something's wrong. So you didn't hear my brilliant intro? Too bad, too bad. Oh, uh, uh, is, it, is it any better? You can hear me, hear me now? Okay, one more time, one more time. I guess my head is not really compatible with that. Okay, so once more. <laughs> Maybe this time it will be faster. So my name is Maciek Prochniak, and uh, I'm an algebraic topologist, and for a few years I, I'm been working in Warsaw software house named Tog. In my humble opinion, it's the best software house in Warsaw. So if you want to work in, in Warsaw, just give us a line, give us a hint. And today we'll be talking about data house, about the data that, that flows through your applications and that floods your data centers, your disks, and everything like that. And how can we handle that? But first, let's talk about more concretely, what kind of data I am talking about. Uh, I picked an example that I have some experience with, and that is Telco. Imagine Polish mobile operator. It has like 10, 20, 30 million of customers, and they, they are talking. Each call generates billing data. Different kinds of billing data. Sometimes it's like 5,000 per sec. Sometimes it's like 20,000 per sec. And what can we do with them? Uh, apart from collecting, of course. One of the reasons to collect and process them is to propose next best action, so it's called. For example, if you are running out of data, your data limit is, is too low, we want to send you SMS. Please, please, buy packet. Please, please, and so on and so on, and other kinds of spam. Another important application is detecting frauds. Imagine that we detect that somebody calls to value 10 times an hour. That probably means something is wrong. Somebody is cheating, right? But we have to act quickly, right? We shouldn't detect it like next month when his uh, bill arrives. That's, that's far too, too late. But there's also a very interesting area, and this is signal data. Imagine that your mobile phones communicate with base transmitter stations each time you call, and even if you don't call. They send your location, they send your state of battery, and so on and so forth. This is a piece of data that is really interesting, and using that, you can be spammed in an unimaginable way. Imagine, for example, that you are walking by, by, some, uh, by some shop or some, or some restaurant, and you get SMS, yeah, yeah, come to us. We're nowhere here. And that is quite a large amount of data. It can reach these orders of magnitudes, like 1 million per sec. So this is really, really large amount. And what can we do with it? So during my talk, I want to talk, what do we want to do with this? Which, which problems may appear? What can be the solutions? And some maybe slight recommendations, although, of course, nothing definite. But first. Let's look what we cannot do. Even MS SQL Server cannot run transaction in so-called firehose mode, right? So neither can we, right? Transaction is not something that we will be able to do while processing streams of really large streams of data. But we, what we can, can do? Let's start with something simple like filtering data and mapping data. It may seem so trivial and obvious, but if you do it like 100,000 100,000 times per sec, it starts to, becoming, to become kind of critical. For example, if you filter out only 10% of data, that's really interesting, on some early stage, then you'll win. You go from 
100,000 events per sec to 10,000, and that's kind of manageable amount. Also, enrichment in, for example, some additional user data is not so trivial as it seems, because you can't reasonably load the data from database like 50,000 50, times per sec, right? So you have to do something different. And one of the ways to do it is by joining stream. Imagine you have streams of tweets by users and stream of user updates. And here we have some stateful component that joins those streams together and emits, in fact, emits tweets, but enriched in data from, from the user stream. This is quite interesting application. And this is an example of stateful stream processing. But the really uh, kind of most well-known and most common approach, uh, co common example of stateful stream processing is, of course, very segregation. Uh, computing, computing averages, computing sums, how many tweets did you send today, how many likes did you get yesterday or for a week. And here we have to keep the state and update it somehow. We'll see in a moment how. But when we talk about stateful computations, even more interesting is issue are how do we handle in Windows? Because Windows are one of the really big applications of data streaming. And there are essentially two types of them. One are tumbling, when each event belongs to just one window. For example, think of this as events that uh, appeared from noon to 1 o'clock. These events that appear from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and so on. For some aggregations, this is quite OK. But there's, there's, there are also sliding windows, which are a little bit more complex, because each event may appear in, in many, many sliding windows. And when, when do we want to use it? For example, for detecting frauds. If I uh, call to value five times just before midnight and five times just after midnight, we still want to count it as a fraud, right? Even, even if five times were one day and five was on an average, right? So these are the things that we can do with our data. But how, in fact, can we get our data into our system? And the answer is Kafka. None of the things um, I'm talking about are real kind of standardized. But I think that Kafka is kind of becoming a standard in data ingestion in, in various streams applications. How many of you know Kafka? How many of you used it in production? Not many. OK. So essentially, Kafka is a collection of topics. You, you may think it as a message, as of message broker. And the Kafka topic is inside is a sharded write ahead log. It's not like normal messages system, system you know. This is really write a headlock. And this is very important. Both, both the terms are pretty critical. Sharded, because each Kafka node is replicated by nature. And each Kafka node can process some shard of data. For example, phone numbers ending with 9, phone numbers ending in 8, and so on. And each consumer can consume from one partition, one shard, right? So he can know, OK, I will get numbers only ending in 8, not in 7. But since it's right ahead log, a very interesting feature is that consumers maintain its position in the log. So they remember the offset in the log that they lastly uh, read. And they can go back in time. It's not like with JMS. When you process the message and acknowledge it, it's gone. In Kafka, it's not so. You can go back to whatever position the log you want, of course, provided that it isn't it isn't uh, removed because of some retention purposes, right? So this is crucial, mm, crucial features of the Kafka that oh, I think all the stream processing engines uh, use. Okay, so how do we how do we access Kafka? There are quite a couple of ways. One is of course using uh, native Kafka APIs, both consumer and producer, and they are pretty neat, I think. Of course, we can use uh, some standard integration frameworks like Apache Camel. It has connectors for Kafka because it has connectors for everything. People in Poland in Allegro built fully-fledged message broker built on Kafka with REST API. I'm talking about it because I was a part of the development team sometime. So yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and of course, you can, uh, you can consume Kafka streams and produce them with some ACA streams, 
all the functional reactive stuff. But I won't tell you about it because I'm not really accustomed with it. But all of these methods of accessing Kafka are kind of you know, general purpose, right? You can use this stuff in all of your normal web applications. But there are some specific problems in, in large stream processing that are not handled so, so good by these solutions. And that is fast performance, resilience, handling large states, and, and some window scenarios. So we'll see now how do they look like. And the first thing is how fast it fast, how, how performant our system should be. I tried to do some math, my, some divisions, multiplications. I'm not too good at that, but I reached at, at this point. This is the amount of time we have to, to, to process one event under, of course, certain assumptions. So this is quite, quite, quite small amount of time. You won't get to Postgres or Oracle to collect some data or update in that time. And there are many, many things that can go wrong. Believe me, all of this, you can, you can fuck up all, all of this stuff, parsing, memory management, shuffling, parti repartitioning state, for example, accessing any key serialization. I did many, many mistakes, and it's very easy to get wrong if you use general purpose tools. And there's also a question of enrichment. Imagine this stream of tweets, right? Each with user ID, and we want somehow to, to know, for example, the rank of the user, or the username, and so on and so forth. So as I said, Sometimes it's quite difficult just to reach to the database because what about our latency? What about our network bandwidth? And so on and so on. Sometimes it's okay, right? If you put data in some key value data store like Redis and it's really fast and you tune it, then it's okay. But sometimes it's not enough. And what do you do then? Well, you keep the data locally in the place when you process it. But then you have other problems, right? Because if you have so just some local node without any replication and stuff with, with normal SSD disk. How do you make it resilient? How do you scale it when you want to split nodes into different parts? So these are quite difficult problems if you want to solve it by hand. And in fact, mm, if, you, if your state of your size is like 10 to 20 gigabytes, it can easily fit in the RAM, right? Nowadays, with nice garbage collections algorithm, Handling these amounts of data just stored in, in your memory is, is perfectly feasible. If it's bigger, then it's better to use something more elaborate, for example, some embedded local database. And I want to point your attention to RocksDB. It's a stuff that I done by Facebook, and it's, I think it's mostly used by most of the streaming processing engines nowadays. So you have your data locally, either in memory or on disk. And from time to time, you serialize it, snapshot on some resilient, resilient storage like HDFS or S3 or something like that. Why do you do it? Because your node crashes, right? SSD disks blow up and so on and so forth. And when it happens, how do you recover? And this is, again, quite a non-trivial problem. Because using this great feature of Kafka that is coming back to time, when something blows up at this point, we can tell Kafka, OK, we want to consume, for example, data from this, uh, from this point. We, we want to reconsume event number three or number two or whatever. But here, if it's stateless processing, then we are mostly done. But what if we keep kept our state in memory or on disk? Then we send a snapshot, serialize it from time to time to our HDFS. But how do we make sure that these uh, these offsets in Kafka and our last backups are in sync, right? It's pretty easy to do it um, in a way that we achieve uh, at least one, at least one uh, guarantees. But then it may well happen that that our aggregations that we kept in state are broken, right? Because, for example, this uh, this message will appear in this window twice. It will be counted twice, and our aggregation or sum or, or, or average will be broken. So we need exactly one semantics to do, for example, window improv properly and, and things like that. And fortunately, there are some clever algorithm, algorithms invented in some of them in the 80s, like Chandler Lamport algorithm. 
and they basically tell to emit from time to time kind of watermarks, barriers that flow through a processing application. And they represent certain consistent points in time. And we, when each part of your application receives this, mm, this watermark, it triggers snapshotting. Right? So if the application blows out, some mechanism uh, searches for last consistent snapshots and recovers this and this. In, in this point in time, this and this point in time. And because the barrier flew synchronously with the events, this, uh, the state is still consistent. So probably you didn't follow me <laughs> because I, I didn't explain it too clearly. But the good news is that we don't have to implement it ourselves. We just have to pick a good framework that has it implemented. But still, we're not done yet because Kafka is not transactional. And even if this part is exactly once, if we send this message to Kafka, then it's gone, right? It's on the wire. So our clients have to handle still duplicates. I mean, the averages will be completed, computed properly, but duplicates are, uh, are possible. So state handling and resilience is pretty hard. But it's even harder when Windows comes into play. Imagine we want to, to group our messages in Windows. One with two, three, four, five together, and six and seven. But what happens if the events come out of order and they are delayed for a conceivable amount of time? So first comes one, then three, then two, and what? How do we know that here we should close the event for one and two? How do we know if some, I don't know, one and a half arrives? These are difficult questions, and they, are, and they don't have proper answers. One way to deal with that is to generate watermarks. A watermark is some, it's something that our system assumes that at this point in time, we assume that no events, uh, events with, uh, with event time earlier than two will appear. At this point, we assume that nothing with timestamp earlier, earlier than six will appear, right? But these are some, usually some characteristic ways of determining when, when to generate such watermark. Because we, if we do it too, too rarely, we will have long delays, for example, and that will affect our latency. But what happens if some some bad events arrives, arrive even, even after generating this watermark. Then this window is essentially closed, right, with three and four. And what should we do with this late event? Should we ignore it? Should we somehow, I don't know, pull this window from somewhere and update it? Or should we just create another window with this orange color and pretend nothing happens? And the point is that there's no good answer, right? Because it all depends on you, your use case. But your framework should support you in that by, by supplying some good APIs. OK. So I hope I didn't scare you. But these are the problems that may arise each time when we do our processing application, that stream processing application that will handle with various stateful computation. And what are the solutions? In fact, there are quite a few of them. When I first mm, prepared this talk, some of them didn't even exist, right? And this was even like three or four months ago. So there are quite many of them. And today I'll focus on three, maybe not most well known, but, but they are interesting on, on different grounds. So we'll start with something new and simple. And these are Kafka streams. Not many of you told me that uh, you know Kafka, so I won't even ask some men how many of you know about Kafka streams, because this is really, really new thing. Kafka 0.10 was released like two weeks ago. When I did this talk in Kiev three weeks ago, on this slide I had not released yet, and now I had to change it. So now it's OK, I don't know if it's production ready, but I think but at least it's not snapshot or milestone, so we can try it. What's really remarkable is that it's 17,000 lines of code. I think it's including Apache licenses. 
So that, that is really neat, coherent library. This is, this is really cool how much they, they were able to achieve with such amount of code. And of course, it's backed by Confluent, which backs the whole Kafka ecosystem. So it has some commercial backing. It's not done by, by one person. And what is the vision be behind um, Kafka Streams? Well, they position their solution as a library, right? It's not a fully fledged framework that will start you a cluster of nodes that you run on Yarn, Mesos, or whatever. It's just a library that you can embed in your microservice, in your normal Spring application, in your normal web application. You can use your very favorite dependency injection framework, very favorite monitoring, and so on and so forth, right? Kafka is just a small piece that will handle streaming for you, right? And uh, they position themselves as a solution for dealing with business processes. When you have dedicated team that codes, implements some application that deals with business process, have deployment, mechanisms, continuous integration, and so on and so forth. And what is really interesting is that they are fully leveraging all these nice Kafka features that I told you about. And that's why their code is so small. Right, because all the heavy lifting is done in Kafka, which I think is like, I would assume that like 100,000 lines probably. So when, you, when your messages flow through Kafka stream application, if you want, for example, to, to convert the key of the message from, I don't know, user ID to message ID, if you want to handle state somehow, if you want to change the number of partitions for different tasks, then you always have to go through Kafka, some additional Kafka topics, so that it can do the heavy lifting, right? So, okay, I don't see the code on my laptop, so I'll have to look here, but okay, we'll see. I have some demo. I don't, I, 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 I don't think I'll, I'm brave enough to do live coding. But I've done some custom messages generator, generator. So we have two topics. One is for users. Here's Nikita. Run user like free age. So this is stream of user updates. And this is stream of messages by those users. Right? They are randomly generated. So. Uh, so don't assume it's, uh, they will be uh, very wise. So let's see how example Kafka Streams application look like. I've prepared some, um, some custom code helpers, but I sh won't show them <laughs> uh, not to scare you. So first, we have a builder. We have a case strip builder. And we declare that we want to consume from stream named messages. I, I did some some topic names and not to, not to get lost. And we say, OK, this, the key of the message is string. Then we serialize it with serialize the payload, which is, of course, byte array in Kafka as message. And what will we do? We count messages by key. Oh, I should run it, probably, so we can see something. This is, we will, why do? OK, not too bad. Mm. Uh, we count by key. See, we, here we, we are dealing with state, but with stateful computation, so we have to give Kafka streams a name of Kafka stream where it will handle state. It's quite complex, but I won't go into the details. And then we have our, uh, our output stream. We serialize it to, to another stream, right? Stream with events with message counts per user, right? We tell them how to serialize that, and we will see lower, 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 lower. Oh, you see? And here are the stream of from message count with, with, uh, with increasing count of messages per user, right? This is a cool thing that I learned how to make colors for a terminal. I was so proud of it. I, I had to just to include it in the, in the demo. What else can we do with Kafka streams? We can join streams. This is actually, this is pretty cool. And Kafka Streams is able to, to use what they call table stream duality. Because if you think about a database table, and you think about all the updates on this table, 
let's assume that it has a key and some kind of payload. So it's more like key value table. Then the updates on the table give rise to a stream of events. And a stream of events quite often can be described as an updates to a table. For example, updates on, on the users. So Kafka APIs leverage that. So we have a stream of users, right? And we say, OK, we want to treat this stream as a table. And here we have streams of messages. And here we can do left join on streams. Now, this is actually pretty cool. Here we have the operations that we perform on those streams, right? This is an enriching message with the user. We do left join. And now we have a message message with user, right? So we can filter, for example, oh, I can run yet another demo and stop that one. Uh, so we can filter out, for example, messages from users that I have rank higher than five, right? This is pretty cool. And we, we send it to yet another topic. OK, uh, this demo is, no, I have, no. This demo is dead, this demo is running, and what do we have here? Let's go lower, lower, oh, see? You see, Alex? Alex, that's you. You are a highly ranked user. Congratulations. Okay? So this is how you do it. How you do it. So you see, this DSL is pretty neat. It's pretty cool, at least in my opinion. And let's see how it handles Windows. We have, again, stream of messages, and now, we extract a topic and the rate of the message, how, how highly ranked the message was, and now we aggregate. We compute the running averages of, of, of rates, and we say, OK, we want to emit that in tumbling windows of, of for example, length of 10, 10 seconds, right? And then, again, we can map the values to, to put it into different stream, and then we put it into, into yet another Kafka stream to, to be able to see it. See? So these are the, 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 the average rates of, no, this is something. I, I, ah, this is, yeah, <laughs> sorry. In, in this demo, I have two stream. One is example of tumbling windows. This is this one, see? This is the window from, of 10 seconds. And here we have example of what Kafka Stream describes as hopping windows. And these are, by other frameworks, they are called like sli sliding windows. They are a little bit more elaborate because we have to tell them not only the length of window, but the slide. So when we have sliding window, it doesn't move continuously because we, we, we live in a physical world. So it just slides by, by some, some steps. And here we define the steps. But again, you see that it's nothing to be afraid of. OK, that was quick, but I hope to convince you that Kafka Streams is a cool library and it's worth looking at. But it cannot do anything. It's really new and immature. And as I said, <laughs> its main reason to exist is to integrate with Kafka, right? So if you want to ingest your data or put your data into some other, other sources, then it's no way to go. It also doesn't feature exactly one semantics. It's only all the state handling is, at least at the moment, is at least one. So if you have to have better guarantees, it's also no way to go. And also it's a library. And sometimes you want to have a framework when you just run your cluster once, you monitor it once, and you just tell your analytics or data scientists, OK, just take your conditions, take your business code, and run it on, on our cluster, right? So Kafka Streams is not a good solution for that. But we have the answer. And one of the answers is Apache Flink. How many of you have heard of Apache Flink? Again, anybody? Well, that's great, because Flink is also a pretty new framework. Uh, it graduated as Apache top-level projects like one year ago. I think like three or four months ago, it reached uh, version 1.0. I've used it an, a little bit in kind of production, and I can tell you it's pretty stable. It's pretty easy to use. The company that backs it is called Data Artisans, and they are based in Berlin, so not, not in the States as Databricks, so it's also 
I think it's a plus. And why do I tell you about Flink? Because it has pretty nice features. It processes data with very low latency, unlike, for example, Spark Streaming, which does micro-batching. It supports exactly one semantics just by the algorithm that I tried to describe to you. It can handle massive, massive states, like many gigabytes. I tried it, and I know that it works. And it has quite rich window API that allows you to describe many of the scenarios that I tried briefly to talk you about. And it's a framework. Oh, no, no. It's a framework. So it's not library like Kafka. But you have a certain cluster of, um, cluster of nodes. There are task managers that do, do the real work. There's job manager that just coordinates, manages, monitors, and so on, and tells people off. And there's you. You just supply your business code to the cluster, to the job manager, and then it decides, OK, this will be handled by this task manager in, in this node of our cluster and this somewhere else. And where, when job manager decides about that, then each task manager has some certain amount of kind of processing power. You can associate it more or less with processing cores. And job manager may decide that two cores of the first node will deal with the blue process, and two cores of this node will deal also with blue process. The yellow one will be handled by one slot. And these are small, so it will be handled just by one node. And the nodes are doing all the work. They're working, working, working. And from time to time, they send these distributed snapshots to job manager. And then his job is to coordinate that, to receive all the updates from all the nodes, and to send the, the state to, for example, HDFS as free or wherever you want. Right? So this is more or less basic architecture. And the thing that uh, differentiates this Flink from Kafka Streams is that the nodes, the task managers, communicate with themselves. And if you want to, for example, change parallelism of, of processing, you want to shuffle state for some unknown reason, or you, have to, you want to change the keys of some messages, you can do it just with Flink. You don't need additional, for example, Kafka topic to do that. And this is really compli complicated part. So I think that even this shuffling in Flink is done with I think like 100,000 lines of code, right? So much more than <laughs> whole Kafka streams. OK, so now I will show you how, how Flink looks like. Hopefully, if I uh, will stop these, all these demos because I will run out of terminal. Oh. Yeah, I ran out of terminal. Let's see what happens. Hmm, I'm a little bit worried, but we'll see. Let's see Flink's that demo. And because Flink has nice Scala API, then I will use it so that the code looks a little bit more concise. And you, as you can see, this is normal, kind of normal application. Like in Java, it would be uh, source, it will be void main. So we declare that we want to consume from the topic of messages. We want to do some mapping. For example, extract user ID and put one of, of, of our counter. Here we declare what is the key of our messages. So uh, the flink can partition it between nodes. And here we sum. Each message from each user will be given one. And, and we put it into message count topic. And here we can do something a little bit more elaborate. Again, we consume messages. We group them by the topic, not by user ID this time. And we do some a bit more complex filtering with state. Here we, I know the code is maybe too complicated for, for this time of the day. But here we are computing as a state running average of, uh, of, uh, running average of uh, rates of topics. And we filter out if the message is low ranked. So here, we define that for each topic, we maintain a state uh, as a class average rate. And it should work. So it's like more or less working. 
Again, we have message count generated, but this time this code is, in fact, it's it's not run in our application, but it is sent to this job manager. Then it determines how 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 the structure of our process looks like, and then distributes is this in into different uh, different task managers. So this part of processing may be on totally different node than this one. Okay, and the last example that I want to show you is example of Windows in Flink. As I said, the, the API is pretty strong on that. So again, we have, we consume messages, we group them by topic, and this time we group them by tumbling windows of 10 seconds, and now we fold, that is we, we do reduce for, for those of you who are more familiar with that technology. And for each message, we, 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 we add user ID to, to the list of the user that posted on that topic. Right, and again, we map that so that it can be easier serialized, and we put it into, into some, I'll stop that, into some Kafka topic. And here is a little bit more elaborate, again, example of this time sliding windows, but as you can see, we can declare them quite easily with some, with some nice DSLs. Again, window of length 10 and, and interval of moving like two seconds. And then we can do some really crazy stuff. For example, at the end of uh, the window, we can take all the messages that were that uh, that fell into that window and do whatever we want with that. Okay. So here we uh, we can, for example, I mean, don't see what what we do. Ah, we count the the size of of the list of the messages that that were put in that window by, by this user, right? Somewhere, 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 something should appear in different color, yeah. So again, time message count, and we can see how many messages were posted by Vladimir in sliding time window starting at, at this time, okay? So again, not much code. We can make it even more concise, but I didn't want to try it now and and we can achieve pretty pretty interesting stuff okay so that's all for the demo uh, so there are many many interesting features in flink like sql api this is things to come queryable state when you can for example do rest apis of of all these uh, windows to, to for example display it in your web application dynamic scaling and so on and so forth but you may be not convinced because for example you used to spark streaming and you are used to that and spark 2.0 is, is is just hot of the press and so on and so forth and flink is not so mature even if it's great but the solution to that and that is apache beam yet another streaming framework <laughs> this time it's uh, it's mainly backed by Google, but this time the idea is different. The idea is to develop a single API for stream processing with nice uh, window semantics, with nice uh, uh, way of doing aggregations and so on. So you would develop just against this API, and then you will have runners like Flink, Dataflow, that's Google stream processing engine, like Spark. It's just like, I don't know, SQL for stream processing, right? So the code will look more or less similar, and, and you wouldn't have to learn API with, uh, with each new streaming framework. So I won't show you demo because it's kind of work in progress. They haven't released much yet, but there is some code examples, or, or of course, in some snapshot repositories on GitHub. And it looks more or less like this. As you can see, this is purely Java API, so it doesn't look as nice as Scala version, but if you look a bit may be earlier in the morning, you'll see that it's quite readable. So they, there may be future in that because it's backed by Google, it's backed by Databricks company behind Spark and so on. Right, so there are many options. And now it's kind of time to recap. How, how to choose something? I have no idea, but I tried to put some kind of advice 
how to choose. If your stream is really big, like more than 1,100 messages per sec, then use something dedicated like Kafka Streams, Flink, Spark. If not, stick maybe with general purpose solutions like Camel, Akka, Hermes, and so on. If you need really low latency, go to Kafka Streams and Flink. If you are happy with seconds, minutes of latency, you can go to Apache Spark because it's mature and well known. Right? And there's another example. Who defines the rules? If the rules are developed by developers coded in Java and Scala and so on, then you can use Spark, Flink, and then you can use Apache Streams, Camel, the libraries that enable you to write real microservices that you like. And if the rules should be modified, generated by some analyst, data scientist, they then maybe stick with a framework where you set up your cluster once, and then you just push, push business code to that, which data scientists can do, probably. OK? And the three main points is, first, think if you really need stream framework, because probably you don't. Probably you can stick with general purpose solutions and be happy with that. And then you have to know your context. What are real questions? What will be your problems? Will your problems be raw performance? or will be handling out of time windows, or will it be enormous state that you have to put somewhere? If you know, only if you know what will be your problems, you can choose, choose solution properly. And then you should look deeper than the API. If you think about the examples that I've shown you, then the APIs look pretty similar. Okay, of course, one was Java, one was Scala, but apart from that, it was map, reduce, filter, stuff like that, windows. But the really difference is, how does it behave? So you have to look deeper than the API. And you if you want more reading, I don't have links, but you can Google it up. So there's Flink blog, there's Jay Krebs blog. This is the guy behind Kafka, and he's really, really smart guy. I, I really encourage you to read his blog because he's he has interesting articles. And uh, really excellent articles about streaming. It's called Streaming 1.1 and Streaming 1.2. These are wrote, written by a guy from, from Google Dataflow. They are really long, somewhere on O'Reilly, that they are really good. OK. And that's all. If you want some questions, if you want to contact me, please do. And if you want some really nice code analysis tool, Google App Sputnik. It's a tool made by Talk. It doesn't have anything to do with streams, but it's really nice. OK? End of spoiler alert. If you have any questions, then please do. If not, well, let's go somewhere if, else. <laughs> if you don't Thanks. have a question, so have a beer, and relax, yeah. and have a party, and have a party at least. Yeah. So, do you have any questions? You prefer beer? Okay. Since they prefer beer. Okay, Machi, you can stay for a while. And also, I'd like to invite all the girls, all people who are connected to this beautiful event, right here on the stage. Wait for two minutes, please. Probably you'd like to say thank you for all those people. So, please welcome. Я хочу поблагодарить команду Space. Сегодня у нас Space на выезде в пространстве вверх. Спасибо, пространство вверх. Наша команда, Катя, менеджер проекта, благодаря ей в большей степени сегодня состоялось это событие. Юля тоже помогала нам с этим проектом. Катя, менеджер площадки. И Маша тоже менеджер площадки. Команда замечательных очень-очень полезных волонтеров. Спасибо вам, ребята. Андрей Рудский, модератор первого потока. Владимир Буданов, модератор второго потока, все еще сражается, модерирует и завершает доклад во втором потоке. Спасибо огромное всем, кто сегодня пришел. На этом мы ставим, наверное, точку с запятой до следующего года. И сейчас авторпати. Вы можете купить себе напитки какие-то, закуски в баре и потусоваться под музычку, пообщаться в неформальном стиле. Спасибо.
Я думаю, я могу...